St. Francis is a very friendly and open and accepting place. And I, I'm been proud to have been associated with, with them now for the last three years. Uh, the gray eminence of St. Francis, I'm sure some of you know, was Frank Macchiarola, who recently passed away. And a, a tremendous loss, not only to the city, uh, but to St. Francis, who, who, who he has guided through an extraordinary renaissance. Uh, and I only wish he were here tonight, because this is a subject on which he had a great, great deal to say. For those of you who don't know Frank, he was the, perhaps the only successful schools chancellor the city has ever had. And at, at the current pace, the only successful chance, school's chance of the city will have ever had. Uh, the format for tonight is simple. I'm going to make a, a few brief opening remarks, briefly introduce the panel. On, on the handout you received when you came in, uh, there are bios of all the full bios of all uh, the panelists. Uh, I'm going to let them each speak briefly. Uh, give a kind of tour to Horizon, the end of Bloomberg's 12 years, the uncertain future ahead. Um, let them mix it up a little bit among themselves and then, and then turn it over to you. The only thing I ask is when you stand up to speak, you identify yourself and do not make a speech. Any question is acceptable, that's... <laughs> uh, does, any, does anyone want to go first? Anyone have... you, you call it, Fred. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Michael, you want to go first? No. No. <laughs> so what do we start on this side, then? <laughs> Michael? Michael start with Michael. Uh, the other Michael. Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll start. Okay. Back, well, back up. We're bookended by Michaels. My name is Fred Siegel. I'm a scholar in residence here at, at St. Francis. Uh, these past 12 years are coming to an end. <coughs> the mayor's record, I think it's fair to say, is mixed. Uh, on one hand, we've weathered this downturn better than much of the rest of the country. On the other hand, that's mostly the result of the Federal Reserve and quantitative easing. Uh, we've made an enormous investment in schools. It's not clear that that's, uh, that investment has paid off. What's certain is that the next mayor will have a ton of bricks, he or her, will have a ton of bricks fall on her head. Quantitative easing will come to an end. The federal ta tax hikes will kick in hitting New York particularly, particularly hard. The buildup of debt under Bloomberg will come due. Next year, this is probably not something you think about when you wake up in the morning, next year for the first time, the city's cost for health insurance and pensions will exceed its operating costs for its public departments. This is not, obviously not a sustainable situation. We've already seen from the incident in East Flatbush that the kind of hiatus we had over policing and, and race is probably coming to an end. There's enormous uncertainty associated with the end of 12 years. So whatever, whatever you think of Bloomberg, positively or negatively, the certainties of the last 12 years are dissolving. The uncertainties lie ahead of us. And the, and the problems of the Bloomberg years that weren't discussed because the mayor was so overwhelming in terms of the ability to influence the political process, those will come, those will come to the fore. So with that, let me briefly introduce the panels, panelists in reverse order. So we can start uh, with Michael at the, on the right. On the left is Michael Myers of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. To my left is Harry Siegel, uh, who's associated with Jan Rosenberg and, <laughs> and is an editor uh, at the Daily Beast. To my, my right is Maggie Haberman, who is at Politico, but what was at the Daily News and the New York Post. To Maggie's right is Fip Avalon. Uh, J uh, it's fine. John Avalon, <laughs> sorry, who is everywhere. He's at CNN, the Daily Beast, and the John Batchelor Show. And to his right is Michael Powell, who writes a column in the New York Post. Is it every Wednesday, Michael? Times. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of mistake that gets you fired. <laughs> writes, a, writes a column for New York, a well-known New York broadsheet on Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, with that, Michael, why don't we start with you? <laughs> okay. Um, Fred had asked that I sort of, in in my opening remarks, kind of talk a little bit about what the next 
mayor faces. And, you know, I mean, I think, and Fred laid, it, laid some of it out there, I think, very well. Um, you know, I mean, look, first to give him his due, um, in some ways, this, you know, the city that the next mayor will inherit um, is noticeably improved. I mean, the waterfront uh, in many of the boroughs uh, looks you know, noticeably uh, better and in some cases beautiful, um, you know, much more so than it did a decade ago. Uh, the parks, at least in the core of the city, uh, look quite a bit better. I think that, you know, I mean, one of the, and, and I, I suppose as I mentioned that, I mean, one of the things that a, the next mayor will have to deal with is the, the, the sort of the, I think, important distinction between core, you know, core, what are seen as core parts of the city and what are seen as outlying parts of the city, sort of the old outer borough thing, except, of course, now core includes a lot of brownstone Brooklyn and the like. But the, uh, I mean, for instance, the funding of the parks remains, you know, a great, uh, a great problem and that one that one that he has really not addressed uh, in any kind of a uh, systematic way. Um, and I would argue, and I know this is controversial, but I would argue that things like bike paths and that sort of thing have been a net, you know, big plus for the city. In many ways, I think it's a more walkable city. And as somebody who walks every day in the city and takes the subway to work, I think that too is a, is a um, an unadulterated good. On the other hand, I mean, what are the big problems? The most obvious are the budget problems. We have, you know, in every single, and it's every single uh, union contract in the city has expired. In the case of the teachers, I think it's what, it's about four years now, expired. The mayor would have you believe that the next mayor will do what he was never capable of doing, which is getting unions to agree to take a string of zeros. If, um, if one assumes that, that miracles will not happen uh, and that, in fact, the next mayor, whoever it is, is going to settle on something better than that, we're starting to talk in the billions of dollars. That's money that isn't budgeted, that's money that's not been saved, and that's a, a huge immediate headache for the next mayor. Um, you have, I believe, I, if I'm recalling correctly, in the area of wages, Tom DiNapoli did a recent study of the city economy and said that two-thirds of the new jobs in the city, and as you know, to back up, I mean, job creation in the city has, in fact, been better than the country for the last couple of years, but two-thirds of those jobs are, are at incomes below the median income in the city. So in other words, you have a lot of service jobs. Look, a job, as I think we would all agree, is better than no job. But the fact is that the jobs that we've created, by and large, have kind of exacerbated the income divide and more to the point in this most of ex expensive of cities, leave many of our citizens without any, you know, really kind of scrambling for basic services, including where they're, they're gonna live. The other is, of course, in education, there's been, I mean, I would give the mayor some do. There's been some good schools created. The mayor has uh, built some very nice campuses, including one up in Mott Haven. That's, that's very pretty to look at, but when you look at the actual test scores, graduation and the like, there's been, I think, you know, at very best, small sort of incremental progress. And with these new tests coming out as they sort of recalculate the state tests, I think, you know, you're going to see um, a rather dismal picture again for that new mayor coming in. I mean, there, there's, I suppose, if you look at it optimistically, there's a great opportunity. Uh, but one of the things he's going to have to deal with is sort of, you know, the Bloom, Bloomberg has pushed the idea that, well, there's this miracle he's pulled off in education. If this was a miracle, you know, you, you, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to sort of lay claim to it as, as savior. Um, and I guess the other thing is, is that, you know, the economy, as I indicated earlier, remains deeply bifurcated uh, by income and by borough. I mean, to go up to the Bronx, on the one hand, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, 
rain on the Bronx. I mean, there's there's been um, there's sort of a great in parts of it a great kind of working class vibrancy. On the other hand, I mean, what you really see there are people paying 35 to 50% of their rent, uh, of their income towards rent, this sort of thing. So you see, I mean, in places like the Bronx and in large parts of uh, the rest of the city, you know, again, a great sort of anxiety about kind of how people are going to survive. Now, we could argue, well, you know, you, there's, pursue, you know, sort of more market-based solutions, you pursue more government-based solutions, but the fact is, it's a big problem. And I guess lastly, in my, in, in the, the clouds I see hanging there, it's sort of in that, it's in good news, uh, or bad news embedded in good. The good news is, our population is growing steadily. The problem is, that we have no place really to house those people, house those people affordably. So, you know, for, in fact, the sons of some of us on the panel, not least myself, that becomes an enormous problem. I mean, there's no place to take, you know, basically kind of middle class, upper middle class strivers who want to find a place to live. And that becomes a real problem for the city, notwithstanding that they've had to actually a, a quite excellent housing program, you know, aimed at building, but it simply has not kept pace with a city that is now kind of bursting at the seams. And on that very optimistic note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, should okay. we just go down the thing? Yeah. Um, look, I mean, big picture, I think leaders are judged by a very simple standard. Do, do they leave things better than they found them? Um, by that standard, Mike Bloomberg's been a successful mayor. Um, but I think it's to really understand the transformation that's occurred, it's not really in the last 12 years, it's the last 20 years. Um, and, and I do think, and I'm biased here, I worked for Rudy Giuliani, I started in a mayoral campaign a year out of college uh, in 97. Um, but I think the, the transformation of the city over the last 20 years can't be overstated. And for a whole generation of New Yorkers, uh, I think we're in danger of taking it for granted. I mean, whether you, you want to use statistics like, you know, an average uh, murder count of over 2,000 a year, now we're just over 400. Uh, or, or the transformation of whole neighborhoods. Um, it, is a, it is a fundamentally different city. It is a fundamentally more united city. Now, that doesn't mean there are not a ton of clouds on the horizon, but that's important to appreciate. Uh, I think the biggest danger, frankly, is, is this sense that the, the period we have enjoyed as a city is inevitable. Um, that is not true, of course. It, it only took New York 16 years, I think it's fair to say, to, to really fall on its face between uh, Robert Wagner's third term and a beam. That was 16 years that, that really decimated a civil society that had been constructed, however fitfully, over decades, generations. Um, I'm not doomsaying. I'm not saying we're going to go through that period again because there were clearly other factors at work, cultural factors, the baby boom generation, the, the primacy of drugs, et cetera. But, but things can change quickly. And just as it was not inevitable that the city was ungovernable, as it was thought 20 years ago, it's not inevitable now um, that things are just going to continue on an upswing. A lot of the success we've seen is the result of policies, successful policies, some of which have been controversial. And one of the big tests we'll have is if we do have a Democratic mayor next, which is not for granted, um, because I, I do think actually the Republican field has been a little more robust than, than maybe looked like it was going to be the case six months ago. Um, Will they choose to institutionalize some of the policies that have clearly worked in turning around the city? Or will they, will they actually start to push back because they feel they're no longer necessary? Uh, and I'm not talking about third rails like, like stop and frisk, because I, I don't think that's core to the New York City policing strategy at the end of the day. Um, but, but I do think that um, if there is a sense that we can start cutting corners, that the broken windows theory maybe isn't so necessary, um, how will a Democratic mayor uh, deal with some of these pension obligations that are coming due, especially in, in, in what I expect will be a real attempt uh, to gain union support to win the Democratic nomination? Um, you know, these are not, these are political concerns, but they're ultimately policy concerns. And, and that is the real challenge, the real question mark. It's not that we have a, a, a number of issues in which our city can become more united. That, that's, a, that's a given to me. Um, of course, we can always do better. Of course, we've got real challenges, and some of them, as Michael said, are good challenges. How do we deal with the fact that we're growing now? That's a good problem to have, considering where we were 20 years ago. Um, but, but the idea, there's a temptation 
to think that New York City's success over the past two decades um, is now we're on a, we're on an inevitable trajectory, and, and and history shows that's just not the case. Thanks. Neither of you has left me with much, so I will no. uh, do my best. Um, <clears throat> I. I think Michael uh, painted a, an excellent picture of, of what faces the next mayor. Um, and I agree with um, John's assessment that this is, I don't think Bloomberg was a transformative mayor. I think Giuliani was a transformative mayor. Um, I think it is harder to make that case about Bloomberg. Uh, I think that Bloomberg's uh, advisors would argue otherwise. Um, and that's a, that's a different issue. Um, but I do think that we are going back to not a model, but sort of a, an election um, of the type that we have not seen uh, in 20 years. I mean, this, this is the last time that we had, I don't think anybody mistakes Bloomberg for a Republican, but Bloomberg certainly um, was not from either the Democratic uh, 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 political culture in the city. He, he was a lifelong Democrat who opted not to run in the primary because he would have lost in 2001. Um, I think that, uh, Speaking from the political standpoint, less of what the, the next mayor faces and more of who the next mayor might be and the cast of characters that we're looking at, and there's a daily news forum, I'm plugging my husband's newspaper, um, taking place uh, right now um, that actually, based on Twitter, looks pretty interesting. Um, I think that... Uh, I think it's, I can't completely discount the possibility of Joe Loda's candidacy, um, neighborhood resident Joe Loda, because... Um, uh, we did see in 2001 that uh, Mike Bloomberg got elected, but he got elected under a set of extraordinary circumstances. So I think that you know you you never know what is going to happen. Obviously, uh, I think that the 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 competence <laughs> argument is going to be a big one. Um, in terms of the current lay of the land in the Democratic field, um, and this might be more political than you would have hoped for, Fred. So I hope it's okay with you. But um, you know, I think that it's. Uh, a mistake, I think the biggest development in the race in the last month was the entrance of John Liu, um, who declared in this past weekend, uh, I think it is a mistake to assume that he will not go anywhere. I don't think that means he's going to win. I think that that's a pretty uh, tough sell, given given the, the scandals that are uh, connected to him. But uh, he has a constituency that he appeals to. He will cut into Christine Quinn's numbers, and most importantly, will likely keep anyone from getting 40%. Uh, in a runoff situation, the, the assumption that a lot of operatives are, are going by is that it would be a, a Quinn and Thompson runoff. Um, if that's true, I think that, that Quinn is not the favorite. Um, I think that the idea that, I think that she is artificially high right now in polls, and I think that Billy Thompson is artificially low. I think nobody is paying any attention to this race with the exception of you fine folks here. Um, but I think that, I, look, I think there's an election lag from from 2012. I, I'm, I'm amazed at, at how little interest there is in the mayor's race, candidly, more broadly. In 2001, at this point, there was much more interest um, in the primary. Uh, and a lot of it was because, Giuliani, as a as a uh, another uh, former Times columnist uh, and and colleague of, of Michael's, my dad once said something to the effect of that Giuliani was like a, for a lot of voters was like a cloud hanging over the city, and I think that for his supporters, they would disagree in terms of accomplishments, but I think that he had clearly become very polarizing, and so I think people were more actively looking toward the next step. I think you know the majority of New Yorkers feel like the city is is working well if you look at the polls. Bloomberg's numbers are still decent, but New Yorkers, you know, and if anybody here disagrees with me, please raise your hand, but New Yorkers generally don't seem to feel the same personal uh, affinity for this guy that they did for for Rudy or for Koch or, you know, uh, going back many other mayors. Um, and so the cult of personality element that has typically um, embodied some of New York's uh, most significant mayors was not present with Bloomberg. <laughs> It's, I'm hard pressed to see who it's present with right now, and and um, on that note, I'll turn it over. I just if, before we go on, I just want to note that on April 3rd, there will be a mayoral forum with the candidates right here at St. Francis, and I hope I hope we can all come. Also, if, if Maggie's talking about lack of interest in mayoral, mayoralties, I, I was just in California. <laughs> um, I was in Los Angeles during the mayoral. Primary in general, I, no one, no one could have told you that if you talked to three out of four people on the street, they didn't even know there was an election, or and they could care less. The turnout was 16 percent. Our turnout last time was 29 percent. <clears throat> and one of my questions, I'm not directing this in anyone in particular, is 
what kind of turnout will we see uh, in this election for just the reason yes. Maggie, mm -hmm. reasons Maggie raised? There isn't a sense of crisis. There isn't a sense of urgency, That's even right. if things are bursting under the surface. Well, I think you felt in 2009 and to some extent in 2005 that uh, the city has checked out of its own politics. And this has coincided with a, uh, with a, something like a disappearance of the middle class. Um, there's an urban theorist, Richard Florida, who's uh, been around for about 10 years, pushing something called the creative class, which is really about improving your core city. Um, and bringing in young creative people of the sort who work in Manhattan and in the central business district, and maybe increasingly like where the Daily Beast is on the waterfront. And that brings up its own issues. We were actually flooded <coughs> out after Sandy for weeks and weeks and weeks. There are some dangers with overdeveloping your waterfront. And after selling this for 10 years, basically that if you bring in the young, creative, interesting people, which has always been a fascinating part of Bloomberg's pitch that uh, we're not just competing with, and it'll take off different cities, American cities, we're competing with, uh, uh, with Singapore and with London and, and with the world cities for, for these young, best and brightest, that that's the engine, everyone will benefit. And what Florida has just written after selling this for 10 years is, actually, and it's brave of him, my research is wrong, which other people had a sense of previously, it turns out that basically only benefits those people. And for everyone else, the price of housing goes up so quickly that they get no income gains for this at all. And under Giuliani, who was not all that development oriented outside of Yankee Stadium, um, <laughs> as the, he did as crime changed the, uh, the map of the city and allowed for real estate development, and as the stock market did well, you saw all boats rise pretty evenly. And under Bloomberg, you've seen these great improvements in the core city and wonderful projects, and him selecting winners and losers and trying to do things on a grander scale, uh, the Olympics that thankfully didn't happen being a strong example in that, and most people outside of his uh, benevolent gaze really not doing very well. And in the process of that, you see turnout get lower and lower as people check out of the, the city's politics and public life and a sense it involves them. Where we work, the High Line's there, which is lovely, and you can get a $24 lobster roll that has like no lobster on it. Um, and that's great. And Chelsea is where a lot of Manhattan's remaining projects are, and you don't see any of those people who are right there use that park. And the city then presents these wonderful, magical numbers. Bloomberg is very good at creating artificial numbers that he, whoever succeeds him is gonna have to deal with. Uh, that the High Line has generated hundreds of millions of dollars in development because all these new buildings are going up there, the price for a square foot is shot up, this is true. But the idea that this money was generated, that this wouldn't have been spent or spent for development inside the city if not for this, is not. Um, and you end up with, on, on a whole number of issues. Stop and frisk, which has become a, a third round issue, issue, is fascinating here. Basically, the city did not give up any of these numbers, it got sued, it was forced to start reporting these numbers, and so you have an accounting issue in large part, as well as a constitutional one. Well, let's, let's stick with accounting for a minute, that has been mistaken for the police are doing more and more of this, or the, the trend is, is on the rise in ways that, that often have more to do with how records are being kept than how these confrontations are happening. And you feel the ways in which the politics around this, as the mayor has been an overwhelming figure, have become stupider and stupider. So the Romarley Graham incident last year in which a black kid in Harlem is selling pot and ends up having cops kick in his door. His grandma's door. His grandma's door where he's inside and shoot him. And this does not become, a, a, it's a bit of a citywide story. It's not a national story at all. This year with an election coming and with people wanting to test, you've got Kamani Graham in East Flatbush who the facts are still coming out, but from what we have, it seems like you have a stop and frisk incident that, that, that actually makes the case for this. That it appears that he had a gun, it appears that the police approached him on that reason, uh, uh, because they thought he did, that he took it out and he got shot. Maybe this story is, is, is a tissue of lies, we'll find out, but assuming for a minute that it's not, it, it is not the incident that you would naturally have groups come out on. You, would, you wouldn't have these interesting Occupy radical types from outside of the neighborhood trying to test on. But it's, let's see what the limits are for debate later. And then people like Jumani Williams, who are, are trying to figure out where, uh, what all this means for him. But the short is... Who is Jumani Williams? He, he, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, the, 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 to, to close. What's important to realize is we have interesting candidates. They, they actually do have personalities. Um, 
they're, they're, they're in certain ways fun to be around. Uh, we, we don't have a city that's very interested in them. And this all starts to feel post Bloomberg in very depressing <laughs> ways, like, like very few people are paying attention. So Quinn, who's not at all the favorite people should think she is, especially with the runoff now guaranteed, Maggie's absolutely right about that. She's a favorite in the first round. She's a, uh, she'd be a favorite in a general. Yes. It's very, very hard for her to get through a runoff with any of these people, and especially Thompson. Yes. Um, everyone is playing a weird numbers game with the sense there's a handful of core voters who remain and a whole lot of money and power at stake and that most New Yorkers aren't going to pay attention. And depressingly, that seems to be the case. People have not picked up on this race and we're, we're actually fairly far in. And um, they're going to wake up later and, and figure out who they have and what's happened to their city when, um, when these matters have already been decided. That's right. Michael. I'm Michael Myers. I'm the head of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. I want to speak up on some specifics about some of these matters that the other panelists talked about, but I want to be more specific in terms of what they did not talk about. Uh, because of term limits, we can now see uh, beyond Bloomberg. And we shall remember <coughs> Bloomberg because of his end run around the voters' two terms, two successive terms are enough referenda. <coughs> this will be the case in spite of the electorate's uh, notorious short-term memory. Uh, for instance, who remembers, much less talks about, the scandals associated with the city council and Speaker Quinn's funding of phantom organizations? Uh -huh. Something attorney Norman Siegel attempted to get to the bottom of through a lawsuit, but was thwarted by the federal government, who insisted they were probing the matter, but never got any results never conclude with any reported findings with respect to why, how, circumstances of Christine Quinn's funding phantom organizations. Now, the recent and current headlines seem to be written against Controller Lou, and they emphasize the allegations of wrongdoing of his fundraising operatives, even though Lou himself has not been charged with any crimes. The ink, the photo spreads, of Christine Quinn have, on the other hand, been remarkable and geared in favor of her first, the first open lesbian speaker of the city council, the first woman, et cetera. The media, while focused on identity politics in the form of first, are not attentive to follow up by way of measuring kept or unkept broken promises or competence by way of following through with the promises of the politicians. Virtually every weekend we have a press conference uh, from Charles Schumer, for example. This past Sunday it was about a bill of rights for passengers on cruise ships. Has any journalist done a study of the legislation introduced by Schumer and tracked what he has accomplished what he has introduced or not introduced since his press availabilities and press conferences. Media types love polls. We were treated to the, new, the news tidbit that former Congressman Weiner spent a boatload of money to determine whether he can re-enter politics to test the public's short-term memory. <laughs> now, I say all this because I think accountability will be the measure of the next mayor of New York when the media barons will not be so enamored with a mayor who is not one of their own, who did not self-finance his, his or her mayoral campaign. The current mayor was given great leeway. His minions were allowed to call on charities and civic groups that were recipients of the Bloomberg largesse to get them to support the city council overturning the term limits law. I thought this was scandalous, but there was very little print on it, very little reporting in terms of the mass media. Oh, that's I will long remember one of the now announced candidates for mayor, whose group received governmental and Bloomberg funding, standing up at a civic meeting I was attending. And when Bloomberg's name was whispered and mentioned, the now announced candidate for mayor shouted, Bloomberg forever! And I shall remember the incongruity to my eyes of one of Mayor Bloomberg's deputy mayors also heading up his philanthropic foundation without a whimper 
of protest from the access board or from many governmental and non-governmental watchdogs. <laughs> now, if we are to have an exact accountability from the next mayor, we will have to do better by way of examining the record of, his, of their promises. Those kept, those broken. And tracking as well the next mayor's appointees to boards and commissions like the Ethics Board and the Civilian Complaint Review Board. The next mayor will have to do better by way of police accountability. The police will need to protect and serve and keep our city safe and at the same time respect and uphold civil rights. Police race relations have not been good under Bloomberg, although they were admittedly worse under Giuliani. Police community relations remain bad because of stop, frisk, and question, and because of a moribund, ineffective civilian complaint review board, a mayoral puppet agency. For the duration of the, public, of the Bloomberg administration, the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, has been chaired and led by ciphers. Now, show of hands, who here can name the current chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board? Show of hands. I see no hands. Who here? I will even include the panel. I see no hands. Who here? can name the current or past three executive directors of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Now, such names, I suggest to you, should be on the tongues of every informed citizen and known by every journalist. No. <laughs> Given the tensions and pitiable record of civil rights infractions of stop, frisk, and question, many New Yorkers will be looking for a new police commissioner. Any mayoral candidate who has already signaled an intention to reappoint Ray Kelly will be risking alienation from the minority community, especially if young minorities go out to vote and urge their elders to vote their way. Police commissioners, Kelly's going to black churches every weekend or every other weekend to speak to the so-called black church membership is simply PR gimmickry. He will not find there the young black and Hispanic males he needs to listen to as he reflexively and routinely defends NYPD's stop and frisk practices and widespread police surveillance of Muslim groups and mosques. Michael. I'm finishing up. Okay. Here, too, <laughs> the media have been suckers for Bloomberg and governmental prattle. The Daily News just the other day decried a single federal judge being the arbiter of the constitutionality of NYPD's stop and frisk practices. As Ira Glasser, the former executive director of the ACLU, pointed out in his response to the Daily News editorial posted yesterday online, that's what single federal judges do. They preside at federal trials and rule on the law and the evidence all the time. Glass's response also rebutted, in my judgment, destroyed the Daily News defense of stop and frisk. Glasser wrote, quote, in 2011, according to the NYPD's own reports, there were 685,724 stops. Out of these, 80, 819 guns were recovered, a success rate of less than one-tenth of one percent. This woeful success rate has been about the same over the, next past over, the, over the past five years. In 2012, there were, three, there were 533,042 42 stops, 780 guns were recovered as a result, a success rate of point one four six percent. Police say that the reason why upwards of 85 to 88 percent of these stops are of young blacks and Latinos, mostly male, is because the police go where the guns are, as one member of the city council recently asserted. 
But in fact, in stopping and frisking these targeted youth, the police are going where the guns are not. They are finding more than a negligible number. Either they are targeting minority youths as the critics claim, or they are spectacularly incompetent, unquote. So the next mayor will especially have to be better evaluated by way of success or failure of the schools, since our public schools are under mayoral control. The next mayor must choose a school's chancellor whom educators and students and parents and the citizenry at large can respect, who isn't a crony, who doesn't need a waiver of the statutory qualifications for school superintendent of the state's largest and most diverse school district. Also, there must be an EEO search. This mayor gets away with even having an EEO search. Nobody complains. Michael, let, let. I'm finishing up. I'm finishing up. <laughs> for, the, for the next school's chancellor, we cannot have an insular pro process. We cannot have, let's have breakfast meeting and, uh, and, the, and have the mayor pick the man or woman he knows. Can't have that anymore. The next school's chancellor should know about curriculum, class size, teacher evaluation, supervision, and how to get principals to evaluate teachers with other than pass or fail. The next mayor must insist on a streamlined teacher's contract with accountability measures or else be prepared to take and punish severely any strike by the teachers union. Now, I have more to say, but I've been, I've been told by the moderator that I cannot say it, so I'm gonna hold my fire for the questions and answers, but I got a lot more to say about higher education. Three more pages, and I paternalism. see. Paternalism, <laughs> and, uh, and what we need in terms of the next mayor, whoever that may be. Does, does anyone on the panel want to pick up on anything else, anything something on, someone else on the panel has said? I, I, yeah, actually I would like to say that I think that Michael was uh, exactly right uh, in terms of the unprecedented nature of Bloomberg's power uh, as uh, unprecedented personal wealth and, you know, combined with the, the power of the mayoralty. And I do think that that, that uh, had a lot of impact on uh, the way that he was challenged or not challenged. Uh, I disagree with the level of coverage um, uh, of how he handled sort of the, the disbursement of, of his personal fortune to community groups uh, at the time. I mean, I remember we wrote about it at the New York Post um, and in pretty strong detail. Um, but I think that as a note of irony, um, you know his his aides were expressing horror that uh, that the that the soda companies teamed up with community groups to oppose the the soda ban, and this was a this is a practice that should be pretty familiar to Bloomberg. Um, that was it. Great point. Great point. Michael, John, and you want to pick up on it, Harry? You you want to pick up on it? Well, actually, I know what you know. What I I have one thought. Which sort of of, of Harry's point, um, I actually differ. I, I think that, come on, that 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 the troubles in East Flatbush um, indicate in in a in a strange way how far we've come as a city. They have not gotten great uh, uh, pickup across the city. Um, in fact, it the the troubles there in East Flatbush, a, a neighborhood that. I long ago worked in as a tenant organizer for a while, and 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 that has seen, uh, you know, is a measurably more prosperous place now than it was 20 years ago. Um, you know, I mean, and of homeowners, largely homeowners. I mean, I think you saw a couple. You saw a couple three days of trouble. You saw a few dozen at most occupy folks come out there, and I think there's a genuine interest in finding out. The truth of what I absolutely agree is that, at best, a very murky situation with this, you know, this kid and whether he pulled a gun and I mean all this kind of stuff. And I think that actually to, to compare it, to compare it to any similar incident uh, 20 or 30, 20 years ago in the city is to realize, in fact, in many positive ways how far we've come in that respect. And I think that that's one of the things that the current crop of mayoral candidates, who by the way have also behaved pretty well around the shooting uh, and have not demagogued it by and large, I think it, it, this is one of the things that frankly is going to be 
uh, you know, this this is a plus for, for a city that they inherit. And, you know, we could argue until the, um, you know, until the dogs stop howling as to, you know, well, who deserves credit for that and, and that sort of thing. I don't want to go there. But I think it's measurably a different place and a better one. I, I just want to pick up on one point Michael made about the uh, Zavine Complaint Review Board. The f because the failure of less than visible mayor mayoral agencies doesn't stop there. We have an Office of Emergency Management. Does anyone remember we have an Office of Emergency Management? In 2001, it was part of the reason we responded so effectively to the 9-11 attack. It has been effectively dismantled in the mayoral-centric approach of, of Mayor Bloomberg. And so... D despite its very nice headquarters being just a couple blocks from here. Thank you. Cadman Plaza. Nicer than ever. Nicer than anything we ever had. FIP knows a great deal about OEM. Uh, uh, but OEM should have been in the Rockaways. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do you do... Wh wh when you have two weeks' notice that a storm is coming, you send out blankets and generators and water, and you, you pre-position it. That's what the, but there was no mayoral agency. I would suggest, and then I'll, I'll get, get off the microphone, I would suggest that having a mayor who viewed his job as a hobby came at a certain cost to the city. I, 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 I think, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that's fair. I, I don't think this mayor views the, the mayorality as a hobby, but maybe the culmination of a successful career. And, and he has a businessman's tendency to delegate. And in the case of public safety, he, had, he tapped Ray Kelly and empowered him to successfully bring crime down to historic lows. But, for example, when Ray Kelly was last police commissioner, the, the, the embryonic Office of Emergency Management was under the NYPD. And I firmly believe that had we not made OEM a permanent charter agency in the 2001 Charter Vision Commission, it wouldn't exist today. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think it would. Um, and, and there were reasons it was created to, to help resolve the bat, battle of the badges. But let me just pick up on one thing, because talk about a challenge for the next mayor, and here's one where they're, you know, we, we can talk about the lessons learned about mayoral control of education and how maybe throwing money at the problem doesn't actually bring performance. So you got to look at something else. But, but Sandy, um, the fact we've had two 100-year storms in three years, the fact that the New York City subway system has never flooded like this before, the fact that every major New York City building has always kept its electronic equipment, including its tech, technological equipment, in the basement, because that was the safest place for it to be, right. and none of those things can be taken for granted anymore, mm -hmm. is a fundamental challenge to New York City's infrastructure, its practical infrastructure. And, and the Rockaways and Staten Island and the Jersey Shore are still rebuilding, but even Lower Manhattan, Water Street, and the South Street Seaboard, are, are, you know, the heart of the financial district, capital of the world, all that stuff, is being totally ignored. So, so these challenges, which are environmental challenges, and that are not easy to fix, and are going to be hugely expensive to even begin to address, yes. that is a huge challenge for the next mayor. And for, for a city that has become so totally geared toward, after, for the last, you know, 12 years of the, this mayoralty about terrorism, about, That's right. about being preventative, about a different type of disaster that could befall New York. This has not been what no. was on anybody's radar. Been on the radar. And it has not really been a, a huge part of the conversation, frankly, in the mayor's race so far, and it remains to be seen. It's a shock. Well, we'll see if people push Maggie, it. what has been a huge part of the climate, climate, you know, climate change, which is a, obviously a broader issue than something the New York mayor can handle, but to, to John's point about how the city, how each of these mayors would do something different than, I mean, your your feelings about Bloomberg uh, and how he handled the storm, I think, are not shared by everybody, but there are some people who share them. How would these people differentiate themselves from what he did? I mean, Joe Loda's entire candidacy is based on his performance. Right. Um, so it is, uh, it has been a shockingly minor part of the discussion so far, and we'll see if it becomes so. more so. Yep. Yeah. Does anyone, anyone else want to make uh, any comments? Well, the only thing I would say on, on climate change is that actually in, in fairness Chris Quinn in particular gave a quite good speech sort of laying out and in, in quite a bit of detail what you know sort of the, the, the very difficult discussions that are needed however solutions. speaking of difficult well no and she actually talked about solutions but she didn't talk about that little problem of a dollar sign right. you know how much money where do we find it? How do we, you know, what kind of bonding or other do, stuff do we need to do? And that's, one hopes, a discussion yeah. that'll be engaged right. at some point that's right. in the campaign. 
Well, the climate has certainly changed with respect to a lot of people in the city who feel that they cannot afford to live in Manhattan, who feel they've been pushed out to the outer boroughs uh, because of the lack of affordability of housing. Um, and when they're pushed out into the other boroughs, then those boroughs and those neighborhoods and those stores get gentrified out. And there's a lot of feel, people are feeling out there that, peop, that Bloomberg is focused on Manhattan. Now, he's Manhattan-centric. Mm -hmm. And people in Manhattan don't feel that they are kind of for, I know students and young people, as someone I think earlier said, who are coming into the city for schools, for colleges and universities, they can't even afford the, a dormitory room. So I don't know where they live. And, and, and I don't know how they survive in the city. And we're, we're, well, I'm, I'm talking about people who are coming into the city who don't have parents living here. Well, <laughs> it's, I think there's an affordability crisis, and with respect to the MTA, that's a state agency, and we're not here to talk about the state or the governor of Cuomo, but to talk about the next mayor of the city of New York, who, yes, has appointees to the MTA board, but who are they? Can anybody name them? <laughs> I, I think that... Um uh, I, I'm going to defer to John on most of this, but uh, Bloomberg did benefit um, pretty well from uh, people's dislike of Giuliani uh, when he came mm -hmm. in. It's how mayoral control happened. Um, they were ready to give it to him because they didn't want to give it to Rudy. Um, I think that Bloomberg has such a bad relationship with so many people in Albany now that you may see something similar. I don't know that it would be quite the case on congestion pricing, per se, um, but uh, uh, especially in this economy. But I do think that, uh, I think there will be other projects on which that will be the case. I, I actually think the Olympic bid ended up being transferring some of its utility to city planning and city development in a way that's been constructive. So I don't think it's, it's fair to say it was a, a total wash, a total failure. On congestion pricing, I have a theory that they've been waging a slow campaign to make all New Yorkers regret the lack of congestion pricing <laughs> through their transportation commissioner. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I can base it on nothing except the sheer frustration of trying to navigate the city streets and figure out how they've turned. I mean, Broadway is no longer a Broadway, uh, among other things. Um, but that's a snarky side comment. I'll let someone else speak more intelligently to it. We, we have not discussed the relationship between Bloomberg and Quinn on this panel yet. I think it is something we probably should get to at some point before the night's over. Um, you know, Bloomberg's made pretty clear with this sort of flailing around you know, at, with, at cocktail parties, talk, musing about other possible candidates like, you know, Hillary Clinton um, or Chuck Schumer or whomever, um, that he doesn't consider Chris Quinn to be the strongest possible successor. I think he also, it also is about how grandly he views sort of the job and his own performance in the job as to who could succeed him. Um, but I think that he has a reason to su at least sound like he's supporting her right now and that is he has one more budget to get done with her. Um, so I don't know what's going to be said after that. Uh, and, and that might start moving the conversation. After June is around when we're also going to start having people focus more. But I don't see any imperative for any of the candidates to answer questions about this. No, I don't. Um, I don't. But I. But I think that. Um, but I think that the likelihood that it, that the dynamic of the conversation shifts after June is high. I don't actually think. I, if, if I have a hard time seeing Bloomberg getting involved in this race at all in a real way, if it's not Quinn as the nominee, if it's Tom, if it's a Thompson and Loda race, you know, he dislikes Bloomberg. Dislikes Lou. He dislikes De Blasio intensely. Um, barring not even getting into the question of whether he's a help in the Democratic primary, which his people think he is, and I have a hard time seeing. Um, but he, he, he gets along okay with Thompson, okay enough, despite the 2009 race. Um, he doesn't particularly like Loda. Um, you know, I, he could end up not getting involved. So it just, it just depends. But that's a, a side issue to your point. And Bloomberg yeah. has, uh, has complicated concerns with how involved he wants to be in New York City in this race and thereafter. And he's, he's working on building out his national profile as the philanthropic money he's given has shifted and, and sort of reflected his new political priorities. He has a lot of reason, Maggie's exactly right, to telegraph now and try to get the best possible deal from, from candidates who, who would want to engage with him on one level or another. Once he's gone, he's clearly trying to establish as much of a physical footprint as he can before leaving, uh, uh, get a couple more sweeping things in. Uh, um, I think the new university, which we haven't got to yet, is, is a really big, interesting project. Um, 
But past that, I think he, he wants to, he was bored of being mayor in his, really by the end of his first term, and he wanted to have a huge margin of victory so he could run for president three years later. And then that didn't really time <coughs> out, he didn't know what his next move was, so he stayed here. I don't think he's so deeply emotionally invested in New York, as opposed to his legacy and certain projects. In the same way, the deal with Rudy was, when, when Bloomberg came in, and they were not natural allies. You know, here are a few things, particularly crime, you're not going to tamper with, and if you do that, I'm not going to be in your hair. And, and that seemed to work. And what remains to be seen what those are for Bloomberg, how that plays out, and how, and people have suggested this, but I don't see it happening, these weird new post-Citizens United rules for how people can and can't mm -hmm. get money into this race mm -hmm. change the dynamic from yeah. previous races. It's going to help Quinn. The answer to that question is that people are very frustrated and discouraged. Um, by the mayoral performance with respect to the schools. Um, the mayor, the mayor, well, they, it's why? Because the schools are not performing. He has all this power, he made all these promises, but the teacher's contract has not been streamlined. The teacher's contract does not have evaluation systems for teachers. All the mayoral control he has over the, over the principals and, 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 the, and the teaching staff, he, well, he, all he does is he, he appoints incompetent people or ineffective people, including the current school's chancellor, and so the whole system is out of control. If the question was, why do people feel that the teachers' union will preserve and protect the rights of teachers, that's an obvious answer. That's what they do. That's what they're there for. The question is, who is there to protect and defend the rights of students to a decent and quality education that was supposed to be the mayor? He failed. Every, it's every system we put in place fails because our children are not graduating as effectively as effective graduates. Why would the media I think this is sort of like Congress having a 12% approval rating but a 90% re-election rate. Well I, I, here's what I mean by that. I, I think, you know, barring the specific phrasing of the questions, I think given a choice of does Bloomberg, who lives on 79th Street, look after your kids more than your teacher? Who's going to win that sentimental poll? I think that's what that poll is a question of, uh, is, a, is a measure of. And, and with the exception of Frank Macchiarola, it's worth remembering that no school's chancellor was considered a success, really. And, and prob maybe even bigger than mayoral control, bigger than money, and bigger than union contracts. First of all, I... I I think it's implicit, but let's put a fine point on it, that the past 20 years' success for the city has occurred under Republican and independent mayors. So, so while we do have effectively a one-party rule beneath City Hall, given the 1989 charter revision and a strong mayoral form of government, you know, it's not accidental that our city has succeeded with Republican and independent mayors. It's not about partisanship. It's about a break from that general pattern. Um, but, but with a lot of the pension obligations and the union contracts that can't be abrogated uh, once they're already set in stone, you, you do have a big snowballing problem. And the next mayor, if it's a Democrat or Republican, is going to have a rude awakening and probably going to find religion on the subject. I will say that Joe Lode is probably the best equipped to deal with it, given his set of experiences. And one of the really interesting things to look for, and it hasn't quite happened yet, is as these candidates are competing to make a runoff, what will the courtship be uh, to th the primary driver of Democratic primary voters on Election Day has traditionally in New York been unions. Now, we have a new dynamic, which is the Working Families Party, whose whole you know, power is, is, is cross-endorsement. Um, I, I put, put aside the, the legal questions that are, are being raised. Maybe they're trumped up. Maybe they're legitimate. Let's put all that aside. How that plays out and the... the the promises that are going to have to be made by candidates to get that kind of primary day support are going to be directly counter to the responsibilities of the next mayor to actually deal with these problems. And, and, and how that gets resolved is a very real problem. Did you say you expect the Working Families Party to endorse? Did I mishear you? I, I, I think they will endorse. I don't think they'll sit it out. I think they might sit it out. I you think they're that? agree with that. You really do? Yeah, I think if Bill, Tom, if, uh, Bill de Blasio doesn't Start well, see, but that's what's interesting, because well, that, that, that yeah. articulates what's unspoken, which is the assumption that Bill de Blasio was going to get their nomination. Right. You think they either won't play if they don't feel he's got a, 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 I do. a real shot? I do, because I don't see what the, what the point, if they don't feel he has a real shot, um, I don't think that they would object strongly enough to anybody in the field uh, to try to infuriate 
person who is likely is to be the next mayor. Um, it's not a statewide race. They won't lose the line. What's the impetus for having to do it? I, I you know, I mean, I, they are, and look, th th this might turn out to be very wrong. Um, Bill mm -hmm. Thompson, uh, Bill de Blasio has not started uh, running ads. He won't do that, I think, until the end of the race. And maybe that'll move the, the dial. But I kind of doubt it. I don't see the clear path for him to improve in polls, even, even assuming the Quinn's numbers start coming down and Bill Thompson start rising. I, I just don't see where okay. his but Maggie, road is. There's another element to this. Uh, de Blasio expected Lou to drop out. Yes, that is true. And, and he would then be a much stronger candidate. But even, he, I, I agree with you, they may, they may, may, may very well not endorse because they can have so much strength in the city council. Yes. They're likely Correct. to dominate the city council, whoever the next mayor is. Correct. And with that, Freddie, do you want the microphone? Um, before I do, I want to take exception to something that was said. I, I take issue with uh, stop and frisk, police abuse, misconduct, school policy, and, and educational reform being marginal issues. They are not. The question of freedom and individual rights are never marginal. Now, you may think that your priorities are pensions and stuff like that, and that's fair enough. But don't marginalize issues which, which motivate people to go to the polls. And That's very this funny. is not Wisconsin. This is New York. <clears throat> I would also actually would add, just add on to what Michael said. I think that, it, that, A, I think that's a fair point, and B, I think that to assume that uh, the next mayor is just going to say no matter what, we're going to have to keep the, kitty, the, the city safe, assumes that, that Bill de Blasio, uh, John Liu, um, are, are, and Bill Thompson are just sort of mouthing. Even Chris Quinn today, I think, agreed to an independent uh, ins inspector general of the NYPD that assumes that everybody is basically just talking pablum until they get into the office, and then they're going to discover how tough it is. I think that a lot of people have real concerns with, with stop and frisk and how it's been execute and then they have concerns with what they perceive as a tenure on the part of the mayor um, and on his administration. Do so. we agree that almost whoever is the next mayor stop and frisk is likely to be amended if not ended? No. If it only is a differential with this mayor? Not whoever. Who, who do you think would keep it? I think Quinn would keep it. You think Quinn would keep I it? Do. As is? That, that, that's what she yeah, means what when she says uh, No, I, I don't think Quinn would keep it. Not, not, not nearly at the level that it is form. today. So uh, you know, and if you cut it back, right. I mean, there is a, there's probably, a, there's a legal, it strikes me, a legal, uh, you know, level at which one can conduct stop and frisks. And I think there's, the, I'm obviously showing my cards, I think there's an illegal uh, level, and I think we're there, you know, and, and I very much agree with Michael. I mean, you know, to, it takes approximately five minutes of walking the streets and talking to young, you know, black and Latino men to realize that it is, that this is a problem that none of us would tolerate for our own kids. It isn't to argue that there's no level again, but I just think that, yes, so I, I think that I would expect that anyone except perhaps a, a Loda would, and I don't know where Loda stands on this, would, uh, would, would pull back on that a bit. I just don't think for one thing, it's an important piece of the policing strategy that that the other that has otherwise been developed in the last 15, 20 years. But the, the outstanding question is what happens if somebody comes in, pulls back, and when you're pulling back, you have some control over, over how many of these are happening, the, 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 the sort of implicit quotas, and sometimes not so implicit ones you're putting on the officers. If you do this and the numbers start going up, either because crime is getting worse, or because at the margins, the numbers turn out to have been baked, and you correct for that, and suddenly you're under intense pressure from the, the tabloids, the evening news, and so on, the, the, the weight, is the city getting out of control? I think anyone who comes in is gonna do the, 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 the let's step back, let's be reasonable, let's amend this. But in, in amending the policy, you, you're leaving your options very open. Yeah. And there, again, there are a lot of bookkeeping and paper ways. Sure. You can have a, an aggressive policy that doesn't show up or register right away. Uh, while continuing to aggressively police if you're feeling that political pressure from your right, which sure. seems likely to me. It, and and that, that is what's likely. But I think we all know and all agree that stop and frisk is not the core of the New York City yeah. policing innovations yeah, right. and Comstat and broke windows theory that made the city safe. It, it is not the core plank that the whole thing's built on. And, so in and, some ways... And Police Commissioner Bill Bratton, who I discussed this issue with, he understands that you can have effective policing without what you call illegal, unconstitutional stops and frisk. Mayor Bloomberg and Police Commissioner 
Kelly do not understand that. They give lip service to it, but they continue to, to, to practice stop and frisk in unconstitutional and illegal ways, and that's why the courts have been involved. That's why the, court has, the courts have, have declared, in effect, uh, stop and frisk in New York to be unconstitutional. But the, the signal from the mayor will be, who will the mayor appoint police commissioner? If you're going to appoint the same guy who keeps saying, what we do is legal, what we do is constitutional, when the court says it's not, then you're sending a signal that you're not serious. So I think that, um, yes, Christine Quinn, who I served with on Giuliani's Police uh, uh, Community Relations Task Force and Commissioner, she knows these issues. As Speaker of the City Council, she knows and receives reports from the civilian, the incompetent Civilian Complaint Review Board. She hasn't done a thing all the time she's been in, in, in City Council and Speaker because she doesn't want to do anything. Let me jump in with just one more thing here. The healthy thing about having a new mayor is going to be responsive to political pressures again in a way this mayor frequently has not been. And this commissioner, who is now the longest serving easily commissioner the city has ever had, just in this run, even leaving aside the other four years, um, is you, you will see the, 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 the way these issues get litigated out what isn't isn't politically palatable is going to shift pretty dramatically. There simply has not been a, uh, this is, you can boo me at parades, uh, on school control. Um, the ordinary pressures have not come to bear here on this administration, and any, any future one is going to have to be, I think in very healthy ways, more responsive to, to the people this hurts. I think the critics of stop and frisk have, have damaged themselves because it's not core to what the police do, but by saying there's no efficacy here, or no gain, or look how low the, uh, as Michael just did, you know, how, how few guns they're actually getting, in a way that doesn't ring true to, uh, to, to, to a lot of people, and also help explain Kelly and the department's relatively high numbers uh, in, in the minority community. However, there, there, there are tremendous dignity and constitutional problems with, the, with this policy, and I think you'll see uh, political reality and gravity set back in with, with a new administration, and that, that will really shift the terms of this debate. As, as a columnist, not a, not a political reporter, right. who doesn't cover local anymore, um, I already actually let the cat out of the bag with a column I wrote uh, a, a few weeks ago. I, I personally think Joe Loto would be, would be the best mayor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, already said it, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and again, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be unbiased in this because I worked with him in the Giuliani administration, went through 9-11 together. Um, and uh, I think he'd be a great mayor. I, I really think there's, you know, only only one or two candidates who, who would be an absolute disaster as mayor, and I don't think they're likely to get the nomination. Michael. I'll leave that to your imagination. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to touch who, who I would vote for, but I actually, I'm going to play somewhat the, the um, perhaps pie-eyed optimist here. I mean, I think, actually, that they're all pretty bright. Um, I think they're all reasonably engaged with the city. I think that a lot of it does lie, and, and in a sense to tie back to a question you had asked before about the finances, um, I mean, some of that goes to the press, and, you know, I'd be the first to say the New York Times does not do a very good job of covering the financial uh, condition of the city. That, that That's traditionally been one of those boring issues, so-called, that's supposed to fall to the times, and I think that we've let down the city on that. Um, so I think to some extent, it's a long-winded answer, but I think that if we, it will be easier to draw the measure of these people, who none of whom are stupid people, if we start asking them some really tough questions. Uh, and I don't think that their measure has been drawn so that even if I were to say, you know, if I were, tell you the truth, and I'm here I'm being completely honest, I don't know who I'd be voting for at this point. But I know that all of them, including Loda, by the way, have real questions asked. I mean, we tend to allow Loda to slide by under the rubric of the Giuliani administration. He was the budget director when the 
wheels came off on the budget under Giuliani. In fact, he left the city in rather poor economic condition by the time he left in 2001. And I happen to like Joe, by the way. I, I mean, I'm just, so to some extent, I'm giving a, but a contrarian argument on him. And he went to the MTA and left much too early to draw his measure there. And he didn't deal with the single biggest problem, which is the outstanding union contract there. Now, you could argue, well, he didn't have enough time, but okay. You know, you're, now you're asking me to vote for you for mayor. Well, what, what have you done? So, you know, I think that all of them, not excluding Loda, have a lot of questions to answer and a lot to flesh out. And they shouldn't be allowed to float in because they were once long ago in the... No, 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 I'm not just picking him on him. In the, in the Giuliani administration, nor should they be allowed to float in because they got the UFT endorsement or the working families or whatever. In other words, there are some really important questions to ask. Absolutely. Can I just introduce one, one point of the specifics? Under Loda in the second term, spending increased by 12%. In the Bloomberg years, spending has increased on average 58%. So uh, while, while I, I think that's fair to say he, he didn't hold the line completely, it, he looks pretty good in this regard. Having said that about Joe, his position in defending Bloomberg on Bloomberg's educational reforms looks less than credible. Well, spending on what? If he, if he spent money that helped the infrastructure of the city and, you know... Uh, Second term, Giuliani, they spend a lot of money on contracts. The contracts that Bloomberg has just let expire and left to the next mayor. And because of those contracts, um, which, which, which actually bought a, a fair amount of, of relative quiet and peace on that front, uh, more of the budget hole that Bloomberg inherits in 2002 uh, projected a, a actually comes from, from the, the previous administration's financing than from 9-11. But the point to think about here is that we've had 20 years of, uh, of some of Sal's colleagues at the MI and other people cassandra uh, how we're going to get through the, this next crisis, this next projected gap, and largely because the market has, has gone up, uh, because uh, a lot of Obama's post-crash policies have actually been really good for New York, uh, that simply hasn't happened. And at some point, uh, they might be right and we might have a reckoning, but this is not going to become a, a front burner political issue before then. It's just. I think ridiculous to imagine candidates. Uh, I mean, Joe Loda can't bring this up because because running a we're in a crisis campaign would seem ridiculous right now. Well, but he's running the closest thing to it by calling saying the gains are fragile. So I'm well, thinking. Yeah, but, but, but it, it's which it's, is I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, yeah. but which, but but to that point and to the point, you know, I mean, one of I think Bloomberg's lost opportunities. You know, there's an upside and a downside to not being uh, sensitive to political pressure in in normal rational ways. Um, you know, I think the city's bilingual education program uh, has, has been a, um, a fraud that has actually hurt kids for a long time. And, and, and with mayoral control, Mayor Bloomberg, who had the power to do something about it, didn't. Um, another thing is, is actually lowering the city headcount, something you could have actually done through attrition. Um, something that I wrote about when I was the New York Sun, just, gets, you know, just to start getting it, this under control. Uh, and we didn't actually lower headcount. And that, of course, is what ultimately comes to with regard to pensions. So there, there, there are some lost opportunities that a mayor who is not sense politic, sensitive to the normal political pressures, he, he didn't take full advantage of. Um, and again, I do think he's been a successful mayor. Um, but, but I think those are, are lost opportunities. Because it's very unlikely another mayor is going to be able to get them done. I want to make a point on that. You know, the, the, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with the basic premise that things function differently because of his power, and I, and I said that before, but a counter, a, a piece of evidence as a, as a counterweight, the New York Post, whose proprietor is pretty close to uh, Mike Bloomberg and, and is my, and, and, and the Daily, uh, well, that, that's a different, I was going somewhere different. The, um, that's okay, though. Um, the, uh, you know, the perception is that Chris Quinn is the mayor's favorite. He has been very strong about her um, in, in the things he has said publicly anyway. Um, the New York Post put a, a picture of her from New York Magazine on the front page of the paper and basically called her Dracula. Um, so that's not really, um, that's neither subtle, nor is that him necessarily, con if we're to believe that 
that A plus B equals C, that's not really him controlling the process. I mean, I, I think that I agree with you that I think that there has there is perhaps less of a level of civic engagement, mostly because the last two, not mostly, but partly because the last two mayoral races have been dominated by Mike Bloomberg and his spending. I, I don't disagree with that at all. But if you if you assume, and, and I'll wrap up in one second, but if you assume that voters um, at least are, are somewhat responsible for the information that they get, and if you want to make the, I, I think you have a less powerful local press corps right now in this city than you have had at any other point, and that is not just because of Mike Bloomberg, that's because of downsizing at newspapers, that's because the media is completely different, the news cycle is different. Um, New York is actually one of the few places that still has a fairly, there's, there's four papers here, that's pretty unusual. Um, so, right, and so, um, and so I think that to the extent that citizen participation is the responsibility of the citizen, um, it is the responsibility of voters to, to, to tune in. Presumably voters do know the guy is leaving. Unless people assume that he's going to do an end run on term limits again, and the last one happened the year before the election, um, I, I think it's not totally fair to blame both the media and just sort of the, the process in general. But Well, anyway. I, I blame the media for for put, for for allowing Bloomberg to do what he did in terms of changing the term limits law. Every newspaper endorsed it, including the New York Paternalistic Times, which had opposed the, posi the position they took the in order they could, they could support Bloomberg. Now, with respect to uh, why Christine Quinn was put on the front page of the New York Post as Dracula or Countess Dracula or whatever, I mean, their explanation that could be just because they wanted to increase the readership. I don't know. Um, but the point here is that there's not a possibility about the apathy on the electorate. And that is, it goes back to this gentleman's question, the people may not and the voters may not be interested in these candidates. They're just not excited by them. And this is a field that is pretty weak. Um, and therefore, I do, I do not answer your question because the possibility is none of the above. Very, very quickly, uh, we have awesome, awesome turnout in 89 and 93. And those were terrific races to follow. And there was a, a bigger and better New York press corps because of the internet, because Politico didn't keep stealing all the best New York people for lots of reasons. <laughs> but, uh, and the city was in crisis. But, but, but uh, the main reason you have giant turnout is you have racially charged elections and a sense of apocalyptic dread. And uh, as much as I want to see more participation, I, I'd like to get some, so, somewhere maybe in the middle number, numbers wise. Um, the, the, some, some people are sitting home because their lives are basically okay. It's, uh, it's not even spring yet and they just don't feel that much need to pay attention. They're busy doing things. And, and let me just add to that by hitting one of my hobby horses. It, when you get in a situation um, where, where something as powerful as New York City mayor might be effectively decided in a closed partisan primary, which is going to have somewhere between, let's say, it, it, traditionally it's been around 14, 16 percent, but let's say it's as high as 30. That's still not a really representative process. And I do think if we'd had nonpartisan elections, what this mayor did half-heartedly tried to fight for, and, and, and the franchise was open to all New York City voters, you would have a more dynamic race. Now, as it stands, I think it's good that it looks like we'll have a competitive Republican as well as a Democrat. But if the city goes back to default, where, where, where whole mayoral positions are decided in closed Democratic primaries, as effectively every other citywide race is, sometimes without a challenger, you know, that itself has a depressing turn, uh, effect on turnout and participation. So if you break down who's in this field, you have, you have very, very quickly, you have uh, Lou right. and de Blasio, win office in no turnout uh, primary runoffs. Uh, you know, you're talking 40,000 votes each. You have Bill Thompson who occupied a lot of offices um, and, and, and does anyone remember anything he did at the Board of Ed? Yeah. Uh, really as controller for that matter, he, he, who, who's, who's, who's warm seats. Uh, Christine Quinn, who's, who's run in a district um, and, and, and executed power in that way. And in such a way, it's very hard to figure out what sort of mayor should be from what she's done. I, I mean, you're talking really small bore candidates in some, some profound ways. The questions that are going to be addressed by the next mayor, the 20 billion additional Bloomberg spent in education, what do we buy? The, the, the money that went into these mega projects. I'm glad we have a Barclays Center. I love the Nets. But we didn't have to spend nearly a billion dollars in state and city subsidies. But two other things that are going to come onto the agenda. And it's, it's just very hard to bring them up in a time like this because the city seems to be functioning fairly well. One is, does everyone realize that the stock exchange has been bought 
by a bunch of pictures from Atlanta called the Inter Intercontinental Exchange. Uh, an electronic trading floor owns the New York Stock Exchange now. Electronic trading is going to continue to displace those kind of middle, middle class jobs. And the other thing is, part of what happened is, is what Harry described came to pass. People lost interest in the city. And, and what happened in the, in the civic process, the public sector unions became more and more important. They are the people who turn out. In so when, when, when de Blasio and Lou won their respective races of no consequence, <laughs> With with nine, uh, seven or eight, nine percent of the vote respectively, the only virtually the only people who turned out were people who work for public sector unions. The cost of the public sector unions we're talking about these all these unexpired uh, contracts uh, is going to become unbearable. We see this around the country. People, if you follow Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, he sounds like Scott Walker on on some days of the week. Well, that depends. If you listen to Rahm Emanuel, it never sounds good. Oh. We, we, we would disagree on this. Here's a, guy, here's a guy under whom crime has exploded in Chicago, under his, under his brilliant leadership. But leave that aside. Philip and I can argue about no, this No, no, I, I, it no. It, it goes to, it's not, we shouldn't take it for granted. Yeah, I don't think we actually have spent much time distinguishing between the candidates. Well, yeah. I don't think we well, haven't this evening. Well, because they're, <laughs> they're not because they're not, they're, they are ideologically not that different. So, that's right. I, mean, I think that's the, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All inviting among themselves. Well, okay, but, <laughs> but, wait, Paula, lovely, but there's a primary and one of them is going to win. Right. So, I mean, that's why we're... With the partial exception of Lou. Lou is in all the way. Lou is, wants to eliminate stop and frisk completely. He doesn't want to reform it. He wants to eliminate it. Lou wants to eliminate a mayoral control of, of the schools completely. He doesn't want to just modify. Lou, Lou is, is, is casting his lot in, in a clear way to separate, distinguish himself from the other candidates. We will, we will stop with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you.